Hallmark Hotline, what is your emergency? Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live homework hotline show. It's October 25th. It's my mom's birthday. Happy birthday, mom. Yeah, happy birthday, Sam's mom. Happy birthday, <laughs> That's her Sam's name, right? mom. <laughs> so we are all here to answer your math and science questions. And we're not just here to give you the answer. We are here to help you with each step of the problem so you understand how to do it. Yep, I'll be able to help you out with your math questions. I'm Nathan, and I teach at Emily Griffith High School. And uh, I'll help you through your science questions. My name is Sam, and I teach at the Contemporary Learning Academy. Like Nate, I can work with you on math problems. I also teach at Emily Griffith High School. Uh, today, we're going to have a science demo. Uh, Sam, what are we doing today? Well, just a little bit of studio pumpkin chunkin'. Hmm. Yeah, so we're here every Tuesday and Wednesday from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. You can give us a call at 720-424-1666. Uh, we love getting your calls because we can help you a little bit more in depth and actually answer questions in real time. Um, and you can also watch us while we answer your question. Uh, we can also ask you clarifying questions if we don't understand what you're asking. So many things. <laughs> yeah, so many ways so that we can things. answer your questions. Uh, Becca, how can our viewers watch? So you can watch our shows in so, <laughs> so many different ways. This is just a show of options. Yeah, we we have tons, tons of options, of options for you guys. For <laughs> For live broadcasts, you can watch us on Comcast Channel 22, Prism TV <coughs> Channel 8007, more options here, Livestream.com, search for DPS TV 22, Facebook Live at EG Homework, or YouTube Live at Denver DPS TV. And the Homework Hotline is also sponsored by various schools, uh, Contemporary Learning Academy and Emily Griffith High School. Uh, Kylie, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do here on the hotline? <laughs> um, well, my name is Kylie. I uh, am a senior at the University of Colorado at Denver, and um, I'm an intern here at DPS TV. Uh, just help with any producing duties for all the shows we do. Pretty much. Uh, do you also? What do you do over at the social media board? Well, today we're gonna we have plenty of math and science questions for you guys to answer, and then we will also have a uh, trivia question, and then we will uh, allow you guys to answer it, and then at the end of the show we we answer it, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then you guys tell us about it. Um, but yeah, so do we start with the questions? Or? Yeah. What is yeah. today's question? All right. Um, are we starting with math or science? Is there a preference? Well, actually, trivia. well let's get the trivia, trivia question. First. Oh, trivia question. Sorry. Okay. No, so good. today's trivia question is: What is the world's tallest grass? Mm. That one, that one I, I had right away. You, oh, you know this one. Oh, wow. I have some of it growing in uh, my greenhouse upstairs. Maybe you should sneak out and <laughs> call in because I heard you can win a prize. Yeah. <laughs> can someone I'm ask, taking, I was just thinking about this, can this someone ask biggest. it as a homework question? Oh. Like, could they submit it? This is a homework question. Uh, like, if somebody submitted and then wait for a trivia answer question as a homework <laughs> question yeah. to get us to solve it? I feel like, wow. Like, since they're just like one word, I feel like, yeah. <laughs> who gives a homework question that's like in trivia form? Uh, tr I mean, not a good teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, well, I guess, all right. I, mean, that's I guess good you can't cheat solving. that way, but I was just thinking about ways around it. But you do get a prize if you can answer our trivia question. Uh, is it still symphony <clears throat> tickets? I think it is. So you can win two symphony tickets to the uh, a symphony of your choice. So if you think you know the answer or... Or, or, or don't even and just have a guess, you can definitely call in. It's that number up there. Uh, just call us before 5.30 and... What's, what again is the penalty for getting the answer wrong? Not a thing. Oh, wow. Just feeling dumb <laughs> so on you air, totally I guess. Just guess. I don't know. There's no risk. Yeah, you should just no go risk. for it. All right. Yeah. Guess away, guys. Guess away. All right, Kylie, let's, uh, let's get some of those questions um, right. that our viewers have answered. All right. Uh, do we have a preference between math or science? We'll just go for it. Don't go for it? Anything. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's go with this one. What is the mitochondria in a cell? Oh, where is the mitochondria in a cell, and what does it do? Yeah, okay, this is actually a totally awesome question. <laughs> but, um, okay, so I'm going to try to pull up a picture that will sort of help us think about this. Um, okay, well, so the easy answer is that mitochondria are our sort of what they call cell powerhouses. So a lot of times uh, when we talk about cells, um, we usually focus on human or, or animal cells because those are the kind of cells that we have, so we like to learn about those. And we have eukaryotic cells. 
And eukaryotic cells are uh, distinct for having all of these organelles. Uh, most complex beings are eukaryotic. eukaryotic uh, and uh, inside of a eukaryotic cell, you have lots of little, um, almost like mini cells that are doing different jobs for that cell. And we call those organelles, like they're the small organs of the cell. Uh, mitochondria are just one of those. Like I said, they're the powerhouse. They essentially uh, allow a, a really simplified, reduced form of sugar to create cell energy, uh, which what's called ATP. And that's all fine and well. But the really cool thing about mitochondria is that mitochondria have their own DNA. And that is one of the reasons that mitochondria are just so cool uh, to think about. Um, each of your cells has DNA that's shared from your parents. Uh, you got 23 chromosomes from your dad and 23 chromosomes from your mom, and that's how all uh, human babies are formed. But everybody got their mitochondrial DNA from their mothers. Uh, it's the only place to get it, and in fact, uh, what that means is that, uh, that at some point in the past, all that mitochondrial DNA came from one woman. And she's referred to as mitochondrial Eve. And she's probably not an actual human, but a simple single-celled organism. Anyways, it's kind of a neat thing. And it gets to this other really cool thing about cells. And I'll just say this, and then we can move on to an exciting math question. But eukaryotic cells have all these little uh, organelles inside of them that are doing different types of work for the cell. And one of the ways that it's believed that that evolved, and specifically in the case of mitochondria, what it's thought happened was that a cell that was sort of evolving towards being more complex uh, essentially ate a bacteria cell that was the first mitochondria, and that cell had its own DNA. And then that cell replicated, and every time that, that cell replicated, uh, it passed its DNA to its baby cells, but the mitochondria also replicated itself and passed its DNA along too. So anyways, mitochondria are really, really cool. They're very interesting, specifically because of that connection to our ancient bacteria mother, mitochondrial Eve. That was really interesting. I had yeah. no idea. It's, it's super fascinating. Very cool. Yeah. I just realized I forgot to give you guys our contact information. I mean, you do have the phone number. Oh. So it's right up there. But uh, since Kylie is taking questions on social media, I feel like I should also give you that information. And it's all always, those options, right? Yeah, one of the many options. One of our many options. Our best option, choices. honestly. Yeah, that is actually our best option. So you see on your screen our contact information, phone numbers there, but then you can also send in your questions via social media on either Facebook or Twitter, whichever you prefer, um, at EG Homer. You could text us at 970-680-3771, or you could also email in those questions at homework at emilygriffith.edu. Those are also avenues that you can uh, send in an answer for the trivia question if, if you think you know it, or if you don't, those guesses. <laughs> All right, so now that we have that out of the way, let's go back to Kylie and get some more math All questions. All right, or math. Or just questions in general. Let's see, this is a fun fraction one. Uh, looks like six and one-fourths minus three and one over 20th equals what? Minus three and one twentieth. Um, I can take this question. Um, fractions are, um, I don't want to say my favorite, but I like fractions. They're pretty good. Um, one of the things when we are adding or subtracting fractions, uh, I'll talk about fractions first, and then I'll talk about uh, mixed numbers. But one of the things that we need to make sure of is that we have a common denominator. Um, I'll show you kind of an example here. Uh, let's say I had, well, I'll just use this as an example, 1 fourth minus 1 20th. Um, think of it as this, 1 fourth, and then take away 1 20th. 20th, whoop, 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 hang on, 20. Spelling's not my thing, okay. So 1 20th. Um, this is kind of like saying something like one orange, or maybe not one. One might be a little um, difficult to conceptualize. But let's say I said five oranges minus two apples. Um, our denominator 
And that word denominator, or to denominate something, means to name. And so um, the denominator is naming what type um, of object we're referring to, or what size of object we're, we're referring to. The numerator, meaning um, to numerate or uh, say what number it is. So our numerator tells us how many we have, and then our denominator tells us of what. Um, and just like if we were doing five oranges minus two apples, uh, we can't really take away apples from oranges. Uh, the, the name of these things are different, and so we can't really think about mm, what that really is doing. Um, so what we would like to do, and what is important with fractions, you might already know this, but we need to have common denominators. And um, meaning if we were taking five oranges minus two oranges, we can do that. That's not a problem. And so if we had the same name, um, then we wouldn't have a problem with taking away 1 20th from a 1 4th. So that's our goal, is to have the same denominator. We really need to have the same denominator. Uh, so back to our 1 4th and 1 20th. What we need to do to find uh, a common denominator, actually maybe one of the things we want to do is find a least common denominator. Uh -huh. So um, when we change fractions, equivalency, I can find equivalent fractions by multiplying my numerator and denominator by the same number. And what we want to see is what, uh, which number our denominators can both turn into. So this denominator 4, if I multiplied it by, it could be 4. If I multiplied it by 2, it could be 8. If I multiplied it by 3, it could be 12. Times 4, it could be 16. Times 5, it could be 20. So you actually can see uh, that a common denominator already would be 20. Um, I already have one of my fractions as 20 uh, So uh, if I could just turn my 4ths into 20 then I would have common denominators. So this one fourth, as I mentioned, um, if I multiplied it by five, I could get a denominator of 20. Now, when we multiply numerators and denominators, we need to make sure we do the same to the top as the bottom. And what I want to point out is this. Um, if I'm multiplying by five over five, what I'm really multiplying um, this fraction by is, is 1. 5 over 5 is just equal to 1. And so that's why I'm allowed to multiply the numerator and denominator by the same thing, because we know that when we multiply anything by 1, we're not changing the value of it. So when I do this, I end up getting, so 1 times 5 numerator, which is now 5, and then 4 times 5 denominator is now 20th. So I know that 1 fourth is equivalent to 5 twentieths. So I'm going to rewrite my subtraction problem so that um, I'm in the common denominator, I have common denominators. So instead of saying 6 and 1 fourth, I'm now going to say 6 and 5 twentieths. And then, um, sorry, and then I'm going to take away from that 3 and 1 twentieth. Um, now we can look at these separately. In this case, um, 5 twentieths, and then we take away 1 twentieth. That's not too much of a problem. We're left with 4, and then our denominator stays the same. Just like if I had 5 oranges, and I'm taking away 3 oranges, I'm still left with 2 oranges. The, the name of those objects doesn't change. Um, then I can just, the, the whole number, 6 minus 3, I can just do that. Um, like I would do regular subtraction of whole numbers. And I'm left with 3 and 4 twentieths. Now, um, one of the things we would also want to do is simplify this fraction. So just like I can multiply by the same number over itself, I can also divide by a number over itself, the same number over itself, because dividing by 1 doesn't change our value. So what I want to be thinking of is what number can I divide both 4 and 20 by? And um, we would look at factors for that. And 4 is a factor of both 4 and 20. So I'm going to divide this fraction by 4 over 4. And again, this 4 over 4 is just equivalent to one whole. 
So I'm going to do 4 divided by 4, that gives me 1, and then 20 divided by 4 gives me 5. So 4 20ths is equivalent to 1 -fifth. So writing this answer in simplest form, we're not going to touch our whole number because that we cannot simplify, but I can simplify this 4 20ths into 1 -fifth. And so, when I subtract 6 and 1 fourth minus 3 and 1 20th, I end up getting 3 and 1 fifth. Simplified answer. So, hopefully that helps. Was that clear? Yeah, it's a really good explanation. I like the uh, comparison with the like fruit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, cool. Nothing to add there. Good, good, good. All right, uh, let's go get, is it science experiment time or more question time? I think it's more question time. Question time. Question time. All right. All right. Um, let's get a good see. Let's do this. Um, it says a nuclear reaction where the nucleus of an atom splits into smaller parts is known as nuclear fission or nuclear fusion. Ha. Huh. Okay, so this is a good question. And fission and fusion are really interesting. Um, but we can, I think I mentioned this in the show before. Sometimes I feel like when questions like this are asked of you, what it wants is that you have an understanding of what these two things are so you can tell the difference between them. But I just want to point out that there's really some easy vocabulary here that we can think about to just figure this out. So there's either nuclear fission or nuclear fusion. Fission may be a little bit harder, but let's just think about fusion. Uh, to fuse something together is to, is to bring two things together. And I would imagine that most of us are aware that fusing something is to bring two things together. Or even just the, the idea of fusion, like, like pop jazz fusion music is a combination, sounds like a terrible combination, of <laughs> pop music and jazz music. Um, but fusion, right, bringing something together. So that uh, is likely not what we're talking about here since we're splitting something apart. So we could just stop right there, but I'm gonna keep talking for a little bit. So fission has the same word root as the word fissure. So that's the easiest thing I can think of. But if you think of like a fissure, that's a, a crack in the earth. So it's a splitting of the earth. So, so the root for fission is, a, is splitting. And, and literally, when we, talk about when we talk about nuclear fission or fusion, we're talking about at the level of the nucleus inside of an atom. We either have that nucleus splitting apart or two nuclei coming together to form one. And I'll just make a, a brief little foray into talking about nuclear weapons, because I think that's a lot of times what people are interested in when they're asking this question. So um, nuclear fission is when a large atom breaks down into smaller pieces. In fact, that's how radioactivity works, too. We power our, our uh, 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 nuclear power plants using uh, fission. So you've got, uh, say, uranium, and it's breaking down. And sort of the spitting off of pieces from the nucleus creates heat, and we use that heat to boil water, and we use the, the boiled water, the steam from that, to turn a turbine and create electricity. Um, or in a, in a fission bomb, you have a, a bomb where you're going to create an explosion inside of something that's going to split the nucleus of some kind of a large atom, like plutonium, let's say. And uh, the, the explosion that you cause breaks that uh, nucleus apart, and the breaking of that nucleus releases even more energy, which is a, a nuclear bomb, sort of a classic nuclear bomb. Uh, and then there's an even more frightening kind of bomb, uh, called a, a nuclear fusion bomb, or an H-bomb, where you take two hydrogen atoms and you use a fission explosion, so like you would break down plutonium to create an initial explosion, and you use that explosion to force two hydrogen atoms together, and the forcing of those together uh, overcomes something called the, the strong force, which is what keeps um, atomic nuclei from running into each other. Like, I can't push my hands through this table because the nuclei of the atoms of this table are pushing back on the nuclei of the atoms in my hand, and so there's no going through there. But this is, uh, you can overcome that with enough energy. And when you do, you push the nuclei of two atoms together and they become one. And this is actually how we make complex elements. So inside of stars, fusion happens inside of stars. Uh, lighter elements are fused together to become heavier elements. And that's essentially what happens in a fusion bomb, although we're really just looking to do it one time to spark a chain reaction that creates a very, very big explosion. Very interesting. Okay, I think we have time for more one questions. More. Yeah, let's yeah. go get more questions. All right, let's see. 
That looks like science. All right, here we go. A real estate agent gets 8% commission for every house he sells. If he receives 8,750 commission for a house he sold, how much did he sell the house for? Okay, I can take that one. I'm probably gonna need that information again. Okay. <laughs> um, so you said, this is related to real estate commission? Yes, yeah, so a real estate agent gets 8% commission okay. for every house he sells. He received 8,750 commission That's for a house he sold. What did he sell for? I was trying to write this and I put too many M's. 8% <laughs> commission and he received $8,750. Yes. All and right. then how much was the house sold for? That's what it's asking. How, how much, much was the house? How much did he sell the house for? Cool. How much? So this is our question here. So mm -hmm. we know a couple pieces of information. We know he gets 8% commission. We know that he earned $8,750. So we want to know how much the house was. So this is one of those, again, that it seems a little tricky at first because it seems, I don't know, backwards from what you're used to. Normally it's like, oh, I sold this house for 300000 I get 8%, and then you figure out the commission. Mm -hmm. right? This is like going the other direction. So we can always do this. You know, we talk about this a lot, but uh, if you think about what you're looking for, what you don't know in math, we always talk about setting up equations that really kind of helps uh, with this process. So we want to know how much the house was. So we can set up a variable and we can say C is going to be the cost of the house. So I'm going to assume that you're comfortable with percentages, so I don't have to go into what percentages mean. Um, but again, all we need to do is set up an equation for this and say, okay, 8%, we can rewrite this, and anytime we're working with percentages, almost always algebraically, we convert them into decimals. So we know that 8% is 8 out of 100, which is 0 0.08. So the equation that we can set up is, we want to know 8%, I'm going to write this out as a kind of a sentence first, in a sense, 8% of what is going to give me that $8,750 commission. So I wrote this as a, out as a sentence, but we can rewrite this as an algebraic equation. And we can say 8% written as a decimal is this right here. So we can say 0 0.08, we got this part, of what? And in this case, we're looking for the cost of the house. So 8% of the cost is going to give me that $8,750. And then once we're here, well, we just have an equation that we can solve. It's really just a one-step equation. And we can say if I'm solving for C, this is 0 0.08 times C. So we're going to divide it by 0 0.08 on both sides. I can't do this in my head. So 8,750 divided by 0 0.08. This house actually was... C equals 109,375. So that would be the cost of the house. Um, again, one of the, the great things about like these kind of problems is you can always check it and think just working backwards and it might seem a little bit redundant because we just kind of did the opposite. But we can say, okay, is 8% of 109,375, does that equal the other, does it equal 8,750? So we can always just test that and we would get that. So that's how you'd figure that out. Nice. Cheap house. Yeah, <laughs> very high percentage commission there. Yeah, what a racket. Yeah, right? Be, maybe we should be real estate agents. <laughs> I was <laughs> just thinking that. I was like, well, I'd be a real estate agent if I made that much money. Yeah. Well, can I you imagine that? I would well, love to find a house for 110000 yeah. yeah, right in Denmark, can you imagine? Yeah. And then get that much commission to, man. Yeah. <laughs> ah, wrong, wrong career, apparently. Right. Um, Just changing the lives of children. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> All right, so Just we're kidding. going to take a little bit of a break. And then when we come back, we're going to do um, our experiment, the one, the one where our clue was, was pumpkin chunkin. So who knows? <laughs> I don't know. All right, well, we'll see you soon. <laughs> Hey, what are you doing? Are you just sitting there doing nothing? 
Check this out. Denver is growing fast. I mean like rocket to the moon fast. And one of the fastest growing sectors is construction. And they need workers, like yesterday. You know what you should try? CAD BIM. That's what I said, CAD BIM. What is CAD BIM? Computer assisted drafting, building information modeling. Only the coolest technical part of the design of buildings, roads, landscapes, you name it. Do you like computers? Do you like designing stuff? Then Emily Griffith Technical College has the right program for you. Listen to this. This program is geared toward the student who has the energy, who has the interest in designing, design technology, learning about buildings and architecture and engineering. In this program, we have small classes, we have a small lab, we have a lot of hands-on. We have a well-rounded atmosphere with the tech and the applications behind it. So students have a well-rounded education that they receive and a lot of individual attention to help them pursue that career. Is the industry growing? You bet it is, and Emily Griffith Technical College has got this. In the Denver metro area, we've definitely seen an increase, probably over 10% in architecture-related jobs, and CAD specifically, I think is up about 12% in the past four years. AutoCAD, Revit, SketchUp, 3D printing. Emily Griffith will get you prepared for all the latest technology. There's actually a wide variety of jobs that uh, students of a program like this can go into. So architecture and construction are the base, of course, but there's also engineering, interior design, construction management, uh, civil engineering and landscape design, uh, even transportation and manufacturing. There are lots of different avenues that this lends itself to. They'll also learn the other side, which is uh, how buildings are put together, materials, methods, practices, and some industry practices as well. Get up, get out, and get signed up now. The program is part-time and lasts about a year, so you can work and go to school. So the only question left is, what are you waiting for? Okay, so hey guys, welcome back to the uh, science experiment area. We have no lab bench today because we're going to be talking about uh, projectile motion a little bit and trebuchets, projectile machines, and I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about just uh, a project I've been doing with my students. So let me start by, I'll give each of you guys a pumpkin. Total kind of right. I don't know a pumpkin for you. I'm just going to watch. <laughs> okay, so I guess I just wanted to first say, uh, this is a trebuchet that I built, but I'm currently running a class. Uh, it's a six-week course on just 2D kinematics and my students are building projectile machines. Cool. And as of today, uh, most of my students finished the base of their projectile machines, and I'm really proud of all the groups that did. Uh, they have really great designs. I'm really excited to see how they come together. And sort of along with that, um, I've been trusting some of my students to use electric drills. So I brought one as a, as a piece to demonstrate. Uh, if anybody at home is thinking about trying to do something like this, build something like this, it's so much fun, totally worth doing definitely requiring adult supervision. Um, I don't allow my students to saw the wood, I just end up cutting it for them, but we've done a lot of drill safety stuff together, and so I feel good about letting them uh, put these together, and I just wanted to mention that I think that I've seen in my students a lot of them taking sort of control of the project a little bit when they get to put their hands on it and make it themselves, and so it's been really neat to see. So anyways, I brought a drill just to say. <laughs> Anywho, um, but let's talk about what the machine actually does. So this is a trebuchet. Do you guys know what a trebuchet is or how yeah. it works? Basically a catapult. It's like a catapult. It's yeah. like a catapult. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sure. Yeah, it's a catapult. <laughs> how is it like a catapult? What makes it like a catapult? It launches. It flings on. things. It flings things. So in that yeah. sense, it's like a slingshot too, yeah, right? Slingshot. It's no, like a, it's too. like a projectile machine, we would call it. It's a machine that produces a projectile. It's like those tennis ball shooters, right? Mm -hmm. But it's different than a catapult in one important way. You guys, can, can you tell why? Is it just by looking at it? The mechanism that launches it? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly, the mechanism. So in this case, can you tell what the launching mechanism is gonna be, Nate? I'm gonna guess it's the weight and this yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly, so it's just the weight and the arm, right? So the arm will come back, and it's the, the weight on mm. the end of the arm that's going to allow uh, the payload, the, the projectile, to be shot, right? And a catapult, do you guys know what it is that creates that force? I feel like it's like a giant slingshot. In some senses, it can be like a slingshot. Yeah. So elastic. that's the, the force. Of, Is it it's elastic, elastic force, yeah. or, force or a tension force. Yeah, but but an elastic force essentially, right? Okay. So um, and that's been kind of fun to have students look at different things. I have some students building ballistas, which are gigantic, essentially uh, crossbows, mm. um, and I have some students building gigantic slingshots, like mm. literal pumpkin chunkin kinds of things. Do you guys know what pumpkin chunkin is and like how it works? 
No. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is a pastime, an October pastime of some people. Not really of me, but I've seen it done. I've um, seen a giant pumpkin gun. Is it, is it a pumpkin gun? It was a gun. Okay, so yeah, this is like a, a huge slingshot, like a big sling, kind of like what we have here. Mm -hmm. And you go out to, um, you know, like a forest or somewhere where there's two poles, and you hook one end of the slingshot here, one end here, and you literally get a pumpkin, and you go as far back as you can, and you your friends pull you back, and you launch a pumpkin as far as you can. <laughs> there's an episode of Modern Family. Hmm. That's 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 oh, that must of, be where I've That's where I got most yeah. of my education on this. <laughs> so I don't really know what I'm talking about. But anyways, um, so we're going to be kind of doing that. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just get it set up. I'm going to show you guys how it works. And then I'm going to let each of you try to launch the cannon. We'll just see how right. it does. We've got, uh, I don't know if we can get the, the wide shot of the studio, but we have um, a, uh, a science model. Human body ripped open. We're gonna see if we can't uh, hit that guy. I don't know if that's something we can see, but yeah. who knows? Doesn't matter that, anyways. Okay, so um, <laughs> there so, it is. We can see it now. That's okay. so what we're gonna do. We want All it to right. point this direction, so we're gonna pull it back this way. Okay, and you can get an assistant to help you if you want somebody to hold it back, because then what you yeah. need to do is set up the sling. Okay, mm -hmm. so what you're gonna do is you're gonna set the sling back here a little ways. You're gonna take your pumpkin, and I won't launch it, Nate. I'm just gonna okay. show you. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. I know you were worried. Yeah, I wasn't gonna let go of that. Okay. <laughs> so you know, you put this here. Put the pumpkin in the sling, and then you see how you have a loop on the other end here. Okay. Oh, okay. There is a screw over on this side. Oh, that's. It's kind of hard to see. Oh. It's a it's a pin essentially. That okay. You can mm -hmm. And that loop's gonna go over that. Okay. And then we just want to kind of create you know as much tension as we can here, so that the. Uh, Thing will stay on a screw, and then you would um, you want your pumpkin to be okay. on the thing, and then you would release it, and it should it should fly. It should fly. Should fly. It should fly. Okay. We'll see. And if you, you want, I should. can actually be the person that holds it back, and you can tell me why. Nate, you first. All right. Is there a way to adjust? Oh, careful. The, how far it goes and how um, high. So I mean, point? you can pull it back further. You can go okay. all the way to this point, and that's going to give you the most. Uh, I think I'm going to want to go with that. So why don't, you, why don't you do that? And I'll, I'll hold it down like, like this for you. So well, smack you my face with the... And, uh, and then you can... All right. Yeah. Let's try to get with all these cables we yeah, got the going on. Geez, I might launch myself by accident. Just don't hit the social media board. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. So we're pulling this all the way down. Okay. We're bringing this out. And in some ways, like launching a, a trebuchet well is a lot about the setup. Um, and there are definitely much more beautiful and well put together designs than I have. Mm. Okay, Nate, so you hold here and you get to launch it, okay? All right, so when you're ready. Am I good with how it is right now? You're good with how it is right now? Okay. All right, so I got it. it. Oh, 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 oh hold it. on, the thing fell off. So yeah. really keep it at that, yeah, give it, give it a little bit of, a little pull, back, pull back a little bit. Oh, we gotta make this tense. Yep, just as much as you can. That should be fine, okay. Okay. Just let it go. Go ahead, bud. Oh, oh. oh it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, Nate, <laughs> you it must blast. have been an engineering <laughs> flaw. It must have been. It almost certainly was an engineering flaw. Does it need to be heavier? So okay. no, actually, uh, launched these pumpkins before you guys got here. Okay. Totally functional. I think okay. it slipped off. I it's think just, that I think part of what yeah. it was is we had it sitting <laughs> sitting here, and you kind of, if you can, Becca, for yours, I'm gonna have you do it. If you can kind of get kinda. it like this, mm. okay. so that it's sort so of like it it's gonna it pull back. forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. Nate, if we have time. All right. Failure. Seems a little unfair oh. to me, but <laughs> it's all right. I, I'm glad I'm I got to adult, go second, so I'm not going right? to complain too much. Okay. <laughs> Very nice. Very I'll nice. Meg, would you like me to hold this for you so you can set it up? Sure. Okay. Get over there. Yeah, it's a little bit funny and kind of awkward to set up, uh, but that's part of what makes it fun. Okay. And I will say I only had one student group go for the trebuchet system. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it is probably one of the more finicky ones mm -hmm. to get right, but once you do get it right, it is a really cool thing, I think. What kind did they have in Braveheart? Didn't they have those in Braveheart? Oh, hmm. Braveheart? Is it a trebuchet? I don't know. Is it a weight, do you remember? Is it a weight that brings down the arm, or is it, is it tension? No I think it might have been a weight, because I think they cut something and it released it. Uh -huh. Well, so you can do that with both catapults or trebuchets, but... Yeah. Definitely possible. I'm not uh, sure. watch it again. Folks out there in, in TV land, if you want to Google that for <laughs> us and put it on our Facebook page, we'd appreciate it. I think I'm ready. You ready? Okay, you, you got it now. It's all you. Oh, boy. Let her rip. Oh, boy. Oh, no. Where'd it go? It, 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 it oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay. No. 
Oh. All right, Kylie, last try, and then I'm going to have to do it just to prove that this thing actually works. I All know, right. I know none of you believe me. You're the expert. All right. If this were really medieval takes... combat, we'd be kind We would of be in, a in so spot. much trouble. We would be bombarded already at this point. Yeah, the army would have sieged the castle. Yeah, would this time we would just be goners. <laughs> and Kylie, can you sort of pull that loop out a little bit? Oh. All right, what do you mean? So just on the end of this rope here? Oh, you got it. I got it. <laughs> So that piece there, let me see that for a sec. We just gotta kinda pull oh, I see. this loop out. Tighten it. And then you can loop that around the thing. Okay, come on. Okay, so see if you can, yeah, kind of, okay. But see, it's gonna just Stress pull out it. from underneath it. So can you kind of put it up on its side? Yes. Oh. Yeah, let's try, let's try that. Oh. Let's do it like that. Okay, let's just see what happens, guys. You ready? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let it go, you ready? Oh, it's it's in a full circle. Well. It's just something in the middle. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay, show us how it's Last done. Last time's right? a charm. Right? Oh, and you know done. what part of it is, I think, is that this loop got all tight here. Oh, jeez, oh, man. All right, people. Here we go. That was, was, that, was, that, that, was that exciting? That was really tight. Yeah. It's sort of it more exciting stays. than what we had. Here we go, folks. Let's all try right. this again. Uh, here, do you want me to? I'll, I can hold it. Yeah, do you mind? Hold it back you need to change the paper? Do you think it would help <laughs> yeah, incentivize probably, you if somebody stood over there? I probably should change the yeah, but Nate, if <laughs> you were over there. Just <laughs> I just keep expecting you to go playing yeah. across. So, let's see here. I just want to have it like that. Okay. Ready? Okay. Please work. There we go. Oh, so that is a little bit better. Go. And really, I think, Kylie, that yours would have worked, but by the time... So one important thing is, and this is something that I didn't originally have, this pin right here, yeah. this part is supposed to release off the pin as it throws. Oh. And when you had it, it was a little bit tighter. And when oh. I came up here, it was it actually like that. Swung around. Gotcha. Yeah. So I think the weight of it, and that's something you have to keep in mind. I shouldn't have done a slip knot here. I was just moving really fast. I should have done a more secure knot. <laughs> uh, but it works if yeah. you're just a little bit gentle. Okay, do either of you guys want to try it? I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, we launched yours. I don't know. It's hundreds of miles away. Yeah, time, so there's nothing, it's gone. Nothing we can do. But uh, no, Becca screws up. Yeah. You can try again. <laughs> I might. Here, oh, Becca, let me hold it for you. Okay. Something that you just have to keep go trying and Oops. trying and trying. Yeah. And uh, you know that is actually one of the things, the parts of the project that's been really fun is it's not just this aspect of it, like the launching, but my students have produced three drafts before oh, okay. they started making mm. the base. And, you know, I feel like work? they have gone through, I think you're also, oh. you, go, you go ahead and hold it. Okay. Push down, all right. It's all you. Okay. Let her rip. Oh! Hey. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little high. Okay, so <laughs> this nice is work. only the second experiment where I've uh, started to destroy <laughs> right. the studio. So we'll see if we can keep that at just two. But uh, anyways, <laughs> trebuchets, projectile machines, very cool things. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this. Again, if you're interested in doing something like this, supervision for the build and supervision for the shooting. Right. Yeah. But uh, really a totally fun thing. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that. We will see you back in the Homework Hotline studio in just a second. There's times when you wander and ponder all the labels you've received. 
Believe me, I've got a few. Never mind from when, why, or how. Because now, everything's different. I found the perfect place. A space where the labels fade, and I'm accepted and supported. Check what the news reported. Emily Griffith helps all who wish to learn. Turn towards your future while you finish the basics on your time. Prime opportunity in this mature environment? The only requirement is motivation and thirst for success. Invest in your passions. There's no limit to how far you'll go. And know that you'll have something in common with everyone here. We all chose empowerment over standing still in fear. Welcome back. Hopefully you enjoyed our experiment. I definitely did. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was a good time. It was a good time. It was a real payoff in the end when it actually launched. The buildup was quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it was worth it though. It was really <laughs> worth it. A lot of fun. So try to build it at home if you can. Definitely. Parent supervision. But um, let's give you our contact information in case uh, you are just joining us. And uh, again, send in your homework questions and uh, we, can, we can answer them. We still have a little bit of time left to do that tonight. Yes. So our phone number is always on your screen. Um, okay. I won't read that because you can always see that, but you can send in your questions to us on social media, on Facebook and Twitter at EG oh. Homework. You can text us your questions at 970-680-3771 and you can email at, uh, us your question at homework at emilygriffith.edu so if you haven't got your questions answered if you are just getting started on your homework and you're feeling a oh, little stumped send them in to yeah, us we still have you. about 15 minutes left to answer questions yep. um, let's go back to Kylie at social media and see what questions yeah, All right, it looks like us. we have a new one under our Facebook page. Um, it says, uh, it's a math question. Uh, can you help me find the greatest common factor of 24, 40, and 60? Okay. Um, I, I, it's like, you can go ahead. That's actually going to be kind of similar to what you were doing with the um, least common denominator, right, with the fractions? Mm -hmm. So you said the numbers, Kylie, one more time. It was 24. 24, 40, and 60. 40 and 60. Okay, um, so uh, when we do greatest common factor, let me actually break this down, this word. I, I wrote GCF just because that's probably um, how it's most commonly known, but greatest common factor. Um, first off, let's just break down what this actually means. Um, first, we'll go with this word factor. A factor or factors are numbers that multiply together or not just numbers, but um, they could also be variables, but they are um, things that multiply together to give us a product. So for example, if I did two times three to get six, my factors are the numbers that multiply together to give me that product of six. So six is our product, is the name of our answer when we multiply product. So. Um, factors would be numbers that multiply together to give us these numbers. So for example, uh, factors of 24, maybe 1 times 24, uh, 2 times 12, so on. Um, the next thing we can maybe break down is this word common. Meaning, um, well, if uh, Nathan and I had something in common, for example, we have the fact that we teach math in common. And so um, something that's common between us is something that's the same. So we're thinking of factors that are the same. Um, and then greatest meaning the largest. So the largest factor that's the same on our list of factors. So I have this little, um, this graphic organizer or maybe a tool that might help with organizing greatest common factor. I think remembering back to my struggles with um, finding greatest common factor was, was just making sure or knowing that I had all of the factors. I definitely knew things that multiplied together to give me 24, but I was not sure, especially when I got the, to the larger numbers, um, if I listed all of my factors. So I have, um, I have a little bit of a, a graphic organizer that you can use to, to help you make sure that you have all of the factors listed. So uh, for example, 24, we're going to, I, I do, it's like a little T-chart, and I'm gonna list my factors in the T-chart. So I'm gonna start and do this in a very organized way. I'm gonna start with the number one. We always know that one and itself are factors of a number. So I can even already go ahead and do this with 40 
and with 60 as well. And I can say 1 times 40, that's going to give me 40, and 1 times 60. So we always know 1 in itself. Um, then, so the way I organize this is I'll, I'll just kind of continue going up um, in the numbers. So I'll start next with 2. And is, I ask myself, is 24 divisible by 2? Um, and if it is, I can do 24 divided by 2, and that'll give me my other factor. So in other words, 2 times 12, 24. I'll continue with this process, so 3. 24 is divisible by 3, so 24 divided by 3 is 8. So therefore, 3 times 8, 24. Keep going. 4, it is divisible. We get 6. And here's how I know I'm finished. So I'll try 5. Well, you might know that 24 is not divisible by 5. So I might cross that out, and then I get to 6. Now, as soon as I hit repeats, I already know that 6 is a factor of 24. I've already, it's already on my list. So that means I'm finished listing factors. So I don't even need to list 6 as a factor here because it's already on my list. Now I've met in the middle, and I'm done. I know I have all of the factors of 24. I'll do the same for 40, so 1 and 40. The next one we're going to test is 2. 2 times 20 is 40. Then maybe we'll test 3. 40 is not divisible by 3. And it also helps to know your divisibility rules. So um, that would be something maybe to look up as divisibility rules too. Um, going on 4. 40, uh, sorry, 4 times 10 is going to give you 40. 5 also works. 5 times 8. Um, 6 does not work because uh, divisibility rules for 6 is that it has to be divisible by both 2 and 3, and it's not divisible by 3, so not divisible by 6, therefore. Um, same 7, it's not divisible by 7. And then now we're at 8, which if you notice, it is already on our list, so now we've listed all of our factors of 40. Um, well, again, we're going to continue the same thing with 60, and it's kind of nice to maybe see the example a couple times. So 2 times 30 is going to give me 60. 3 times 20 would give me 60. Uh, 4 times 15 would give me 60. 60 has a lot of factors. Uh, 5 times 12 will give me 60. 6 times 10. And then 60 is not divisible by 7. It's also not divisible by 8. And then um, continuing on, hang on need more space here, not divisible by 9, and as you notice, 10 is already on our list, so now we're finished. Um, so what we're doing now, so we found all of our factors, that really is the first step of finding the greatest common factor. So we kind of, we got this part checked off, done, we found the factors. Now we want to find the common factors, and when I say common, it's going to need to be the same in all three lists. So we're trying to find factors that are the same in all three lists. I'm going to circle all of my common factors in red. So um, you might notice that, all right, I'm, I, I tend to start from my number that has the most factors um, and just check the other two. So 60 is not on both of my lists, neither is 30. 20 is on two lists, but it has to be on all three. 15, nope. 12, not on all three lists. But you might notice 10 is on all three. Well, actually, 10 is not. Well, what am I thinking? 10 is, though, common between 40 and 60. Um, we look at 6. 6 does not work. 5, also not on all three lists. But you might notice 4 is on all three lists. So that is a common factor. We'll double check the rest of them. 3 is not on all of them. 2 is also on all of them, so that's a common factor. And of course, 1 is also a common factor. So now I have all my common factors listed. Um, the last little bit of this part is to find the greatest one. So out of 1, 2, and 4, 4 is my greatest. That is on all three lists. So 4 is the greatest common factor of 24, 40, and 60.
So a little bit of breaking down the words, knowing what they mean, and then also maybe an organized way to, to figure that out so that you know you're not missing anything. Yeah, I really like your organizer, especially when you work with bigger numbers. Yes. Uh, you will find like that was kind of a long process. Yeah. But the better you are with your multiplication tables mm -hmm. and your factors, uh, like Becca and I probably wouldn't write this out now, right? We would mm -hmm. just kind of run through the factors in our head and right. try to think about probably starting with 60. True. Uh, thinking about those factors and kind of working backwards. Right. I also think you probably you could have stopped. I mean, you didn't because you wanted to show all of the yes the factors, but you probably could have stopped at eight. Yes. Because eight was like the biggest common factor between the first two numbers. Yes. But yeah, it's a great way of like that way will always work. Yes. Um, but it does get faster the better you are with like the more you practice it, you start to identify what they are by just yeah. doing it a lot. So. The more familiar you are with the factors. So right. really, truly knowing your times tables, I'm not all about memorization usually, but one, those are yeah. those are worth memorizing just because things come a lot quicker whenever you do that. Um, also by having the organized method, it helps, especially for, as Nathan mentioned, the, the larger numbers that have a lot of factors. Maybe you forgot that four times 15 is 60. It's not a common, mm -hmm. um, it's not a common set of factors. It's not, you know, up to our 12. So you might. But if you walk through that process and you'd yes. be like, oh, I have to think about four also. Yep. Yeah. Just a logical way to do it. So. All right, let's go back and get more questions answered. Right, um, I'm giving the trivia question oh, one more sorry. time. Um, <laughs> the trivia question today is, what is the world's tallest grass? So, so right. if you have an answer for that, um, definitely give us a here, call. Sam is still here, so he hasn't snuck out yet Yeah, I was going to answer. do it when you guys were looking. <laughs> call back in a Scottish accent. Hard to do on camera. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I, I keep saying that I'm going to take the prize if nobody else does, so I might be the one that sneaks out and answer <laughs> this. Go. Um, but yeah, give us a call. You better call soon because we have only a few more minutes left. Um, so now for real, let's go back to more questions. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess we'll do... Oh, this one looks interesting. Um, a magnifying glass is what type of glass? Okay, so that would be a uh, convex glass. Let's take a look at a picture. So let's see. This, these are not good images. Give me just a second to pull something up and. Okay. Well, actually, okay. Just a moment. So, okay. Let me start by saying, and I'm going to be looking for this while I talk to you, but um, let's just think about the difference between a convex and, and did it ask about those two specific types? Did it say. No, it just asked what, what kind, kind of, of glass was it? Yeah. Kind okay. Of... So um, a glass lens can be in various kinds of shapes. Uh, uh, and, and the different shapes are going to allow light to sort of be, uh, uh, to sort of, be, it's going to allow, it's going to bend the rays of light to create some kind of an effect. This is something we see all the time, but magnifying glasses are convex and very specifically so, uh, so that you end up uh, widening uh, whatever the, the focal point is and seeing something as larger than it is. So if, like, for example, you're looking at text on a page and you, uh, you're seeing like a small A, let's say, that uh, letter uh, is essentially spread out because of the shape of the magnifying glass. So I don't know if there was a specific kind of lens they wanted to say, but convex is essentially the, the answer to that. Sorry, that was a quick one, guys. <laughs> we can do you another science one. If you, you, if you feel like be. that was unfair, we can do another science one. <laughs> Let's do three more. Science. Well, do we, okay. we have time, I think, for, for another question I, right, we, before? A quick one. Um, let me see what I can find here. Is there a projectile motion question on there? Do we, is it a quick one? Yeah. We I have, saw that word. <laughs> Probably not that one. So don't do that one, actually. Although that would have went well with your trebuchet. Well, right, that's what I was thinking yeah. it would be great to do because of the yeah. I, You know, I see one up there. It says, what is a prime number? Yes, Pretty what is a prime one. number? Oh, and one. since we were just talking about yeah. factors. That makes sense. Is that what we want to do? Prime yeah, let's do that okay. one. It's fairly quick. All right. All, All you. All right, so I'll take this one. <laughs> and you can feel free to jump in and add anything, because, I mean, I'm going to give, like, the what it is. Um, if you can think about, like, why it's important okay. to know. Um, so prime numbers, we have two, I mean, we have a bunch of types of numbers. But when we think about prime numbers, we also think about composite numbers. And if you think about what a composite number is, well, we're, we're going to talk about like what factors are again. Mm -hmm. Factors are two numbers that multiply together to give me another number. So if I said 6, 
like Becca's example, 2 times 3. Uh, I could also write other factors, 1 times 6, right? So when we talk about composite numbers, basically it's a number that you can multiply kind of more than one set of numbers by. So like 6 is composite because I have this set of factors, 2 times 3. Uh, I also have this set of factors. If I said 8, if I want to know if that was composite or prime, well, 8, I could do 2 times 4. I could do 1 times 8. That's it. I thought there was more for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, so <laughs> these are composite numbers because I can come up with more than one set of factors. No, I know that's not like the well, it's vocabulary two, way. It's two or more factors. Is, two is or like more factors. The technical, okay. technical definition. Right. It's two or more. Um, so, and the reason I'm saying that is just because... That's why the, I was saying, feel free to interject because I couldn't think of the actual yeah, definition. There are exceptions. Like, for example, the number one. Right. Although, when you were saying set of factors, so you could say maybe one. One, one times is, one, one is times one. one. However, it's not we would, a prime number. It, yeah, it's, it's actually neither because the, f the factor of one is just it's one. Yeah. It. it only has one factor, so it doesn't right. fall into either category. Yeah. So a prime number is just a number that can only be multiplied, that its only factors are one in itself. So like three, the only factors are three and one. Right? I can't, and we're talking about whole numbers, so yes. I can't say 1.5 times two. Right. right. That doesn't count. Right. Um, another one, the smallest one would be two because it's two times one. So... Again, a prime number is really just a number that that number times one, like itself times one, are the only factors. Yes. Um, these are used a lot in cryptography, actually. Yeah. Um, a lot of like okay. writing um, codes, a lot of computer programming breaks things down into prime numbers. And I know with cryptology, when they're trying to create codes, what they often try to do is create these really large prime numbers and they build out kind of a code based If you on go that. to my screen just real quick, then you can see, um, oh, sorry, no, there it is. Um, it's just, it's a list of, it's nice to know these prime numbers, um, just be familiar with them, because uh, they will come up uh, when simplifying fractions, a lot right. of different reasons, but. And what you'll you notice is the only, the, the only even number on there is two. Yep. Right, any other cool. number is not prime, because two times something would give you that number. Mm, yep. All right, so we have got to get the answer to our trivia question. So, Kylie. All right, our trivia it? question, uh, one more time, is what is the world's tallest grass? And the answer to that is bamboo. Is um, it grass? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, bamboo. Oh, wow. And then um, a little information to go with that is that bamboo is the fastest growing planet on the plant on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Under the right climate conditions, it can grow three feet in 24 hours. Bamboo releases more oxygen and absorbs more carbon dioxide compared to other plants. Some of the largest timber bamboo can grow over 98 feet tall. It is found in Asia, Austria, Australia, and Africa. And, and my greenhouse. Uh, yeah, and, I've, yeah. Se I've seen it here. Mm -hmm. I yeah, totally lots of people grow it here. Yeah. Uh, and there's even a number of places in the United States where it grows totally naturally. Uh, um, but then it's, you know, uh, uh, in many cases cultivated for some specific need. I have um, a family friend who lives in Maryland, mm -hmm. and the whole backyard is just completely taken over by yeah. bamboo because it grows wow. so quickly. Mm -hmm. They just cannot even control it because, yeah. It, it, yeah, it grows so fast. So if it's a type of grass, is it basically a weed then? Well, not, and not because of that. I mean, a weed is just a word that means a plant that you don't want. But it's invasive oh, okay. in, yeah. uh, or it's not native in the Americas. And it's invasive in the cases when it gets mm -hmm. in and grows, overgrows. But I think also a lot of bamboo is here. My, my mom has a lot of bamboo in her backyard in Florida. But it's not, it just kind of is in one area. Yeah. And she totally loves it because it makes this nice sound. And, huh. Um, All right. Well, we do oh. have to say goodbye. I'm sorry. To oh, say yes. that, but we have to say goodbye. Um, we will see you tomorrow for, I guess it would be our Halloween episode. Ooh, so it'll be spooky. a lot of fun. And we'll see you tomorrow from 4.30 to 5.30. Send your questions in so we have something to answer tomorrow.